Hello, hello. Welcome. One, two, yes. Okay. Welcome, everybody. It's nice that you make it to this important session. There are a lot of sessions going on. And here we are in the Food and Agricultural Pavilion from the FAO. And today's topic is about farmers as soil carbon stewards. We have four guests with us and we're going to talk about solutions that are available and coming from agriculture. Solutions that address two of the major crises from today, the climate crisis and the hunger crisis. Somehow we have to find a way to get the carbon out of the air around 3.5 billion tons in order to reach the committed 1.5 temperature increase limits. We have almost a billion people that are not well nourished and around 300 million people that have acute famine and are almost dying from hunger. So these are very, very difficult challenges and there is no time to waste. So I'm happy that today we have a representative, Mr. Li Fing, Li, the director of the Land and Water Division from Food and Agricultural Organization from the United Nations here with us. The FAO is composed of, as you know, 195 members and it helps governments and development agencies to coordinate their activities to improve and develop agriculture, forestry, fisheries, and land water resources. It, is, it also conducts research, provides technical assistance to projects, and operates educational and training programs, and collects data on agricultural output and production and development. Thank you very much for giving you the floor. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Good afternoon. Good afternoon to all of you. Welcome to the FAO Pavilion and also welcome to this session. Yes, as mentioned by the moderator, we are in the middle of we are in the middle of many crises. Those crises, including from the potential of food crisis to the poverty to the climate change but the rusty loss, land degradation, pollution, etc., etc. The ecosystem functions and the services provided by healthy soil. Is that better? Okay. I'm too. <laughs> are really essential to address all these multiple crises that we are facing. And soil is the foundation of the global food system and the main source of the nutrition that enable the world's cropping systems and by extension livestock systems and produce the calories, proteins and a number of other nutrition. After the oceans, soil is the largest active store of the carbon, I think everyone knows very well. And it also is a crucial determinant of the global climate systems. With the plants through the photosynthesis processes, soil provides the most cheapest natural basis solutions in terms of carbon sequestration. And the healthy soils also are the key part of the global water cycle. Store, storing water, filtration of water, and also soil is the home of the biodiversity. Above or below the ground, soil is the home for about one-fourth of the global diversity. And certainly soil biodiversity contributed to the cycle of the nutrition as well. However, 
the world soils are at risk, with one third of the world soils already in the poor or very poor conditions and suffering from one or multiple stresses or pressures. The impact of climate change and extreme weather events, like the droughts and floods, are exacerbating the soil degradation process. The role of the so healthy soils in human and environmental health also need to be reinforced. Reinforced. Healthy soils provide safe and nutritious food and also support the healthy populations and ecosystems. The One Health approach must therefore include actions related to sustainable soil management. The implementation of sustainable soil management practice focused on soil organic carbon sequestration can restore soil health, can enhance the main soil functions and ecosystem services. Healthy soils directly contribute to enhancing food security and the farmer's income, reduce poverty and malnutrition, and providing essential ecosystem services, contributing to achievement of many SDGs. Why soil organic carbon is our ally to tackle climate change? Well, soil organic carbon represents the largest carbon pool in the terrestrial ecosystems. However, the world cultivated soils have lost between 25 to 75 percent of their original carbon stock which has been released into the atmosphere in the form of CO2, and mainly due to the unsustainable management practices that's resulting in land degradation and amplif amplifying the climate change and its impacts. So due to the magnitude of the soil stocks, a small change in the management practice can really transform soils from a source to a sink. CO2 or carbon sequestration as soil organic carbon through the sustainable management practice has been outlined in the IPCC and also in other scientific communities as one of the most costly effective options to mitigate the greenhouse gas emissions. The global soil organic carbon sequestration potential map published by FAO last year highlights the hot spot area where most of the carbon can be stored in soils, like on this map. According to that, sustainably managed soil could offset up to one third of the annual agricultural land emission. However, other actions also have to be taken, as soil are not, only, are not the only solution to climate change. I think that's just explain the, mag the magnitude of the soil organic carbon potential. Farmers are ultimately responsible for all these changes as the soil stood. They are responsible for the changes in the agricultural practice. They are also the ones who must embrace the paradigm shift and be convinced of the benefits of applying sustainable soil management. To do so, they require continuous awareness and training and knowledge to be involved in their decision making and their daily practice. In this case, the Global Soil Partnership launched in, in June 2020 the REC Soil Initiative, Recommendation of the Global Soils. REC Soil is a very unique mechanism for scaling up sustainable soil management while compensating farmers for their commitment and contributions to healthier soil through financial incentives. There are two different pathways have been designed. One is the green path that's focused on the direct work with the farmers and a carbon market path, path oriented to the global and the national voluntary carbon mar market. REC soil 
include a feasibility assessment of the current soil organic carbon stocks and the potential to sequester soil or organic carbon that's, that's the made and the productivity systems value chains and the farmers that's identified those process. Farmers are really at the center of the REC soil initiative as they need to adopt good practice and in turn and in return then they can receive technical support through all the cycles. After the adoption of the good practices that also need to measure to report and to re verify that such, such impacts of the change. Thus, based on the investment source, a decision is made from the beginning of where, the, where it flows to the green or to the gar uh, carbon market. And then the protocol are also uh, very used accordingly in this process. Rec soil uh, encompass a tool case that can be fully adaptable to the local conditions to facilitate the implementation of sustainable soil management. So these slides present all these tools and the knowledge products that include the global soil organic, organic map, organic carbon map, global soil organic carbon sequestration potential map, the compliance with the voluntary guidance, guidelines on sustainable soil management, verified through the protocol for the assessment of the sustainable soil management and also the MRV protocol that's developed. It's also included the recommendation soil, a technical menu of good practice, the global soil doctors program, as well as harmonized standard operating procedures for soil laboratory analysis provided by the global soil laboratory network closely. In this year, FAO started piloting, FAO already started to piloting this REC soil green path in a number of the countries. That include Costa Rica, Ecuador, Mexico, and Tonko. Other countries have also shown their interest in this effort and the definition of the project area. So hopefully we can scale up those, those pilots. I think through this slide, I hope the message is clear that sustainable practice of soil organic carbons are not only mitigate the greenhouse gas emission, but also provide multiple benefits, such as enhancing the food security, increasing farmers' income, reducing the poverty and malnutrition, providing other essential ecosystem services that also include the biodiversity. More than ever, we need to make sure this voice is heard at this COP and we need to pass this solution to all the negotiations in the plenary so as to get their support to the soil organic carbon practice. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. thank you very much. That's very incredible to hear that at the United Nations this priority and this role of sustainable agriculture is recognized and promoted in so many different ways with this uh, initiative that you just uh, said. I have a question. Do you feel a growing importance among the UN entities for the FAO? Is it something that you can, you know, see uh, and how do you see it practically? Look, as you, uh, in your introduction, you mentioned that FAO, we have the 194 members. In fact, like the soil, sustainable soil management practical uh, practice, and lots of this product, in fact, was developed together with all the countries, member states, like the soil organic carbon map and also the soil sequestration, uh, carbon sequestration map. We developed this with all the member states. And which also gave us already the op opportunity at least to engage with the related soil scientists, universities, soil labs to build their awareness, get the knowledge from them so as to advise the members, so as to advise to the farmers in different countries to potentially to use this protocol. So we are still very you know, optimistic that this could be potentially promoted worldwide. And also we need to you know, keep our eyes on the discussion here. If the carbon pricing is 
going to be, you know, make really break through through this ne negotiation. Hopefully, then the global carbon market, the price getting, you know, further elevated, and that will really strengthen the other road, the other options that's presented here. That will really boost the investment into uh, initiatives like this. Thank you. Yeah, <coughs> thank you very much. Um, this uh, brings me now to our next uh, participant here in the panel, Paul Lu, Executive Secretary of the 4 per 1000 initiatives. It is also a regional initiative that was launched by France on the 1st December 2015 at COP21. And it aims to show that agriculture, and in particular the um, agricultural soils, can play a crucial role in food security and climate change. It consists of um, federation. It, sorry, it consists of federating all voluntary actors from the public and private sectors. So your organization is working with states, local authorities, companies, professional organizations, NGOs, and research establishments within the framework of the Lima Paris Action Plan. So without further ado, welcome Mr. Paul Lu, and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. After Li Feng Li, I think it's, uh, it's difficult to go after FAO, but uh, we are honored to follow our friends from FAO. So you already said everything I wanted to say. So I finished my speech. No, I'm sorry. I'm joking. I hope to demonstrate to you the, the advantage of um, the 4 per mil initiative. I will not come back on this slide. I mean, uh, Li Feng Li already explained the rule of soil and all the various rules, which is very important to understand because that's something which is, for most of the people, soil is just inorganic matter that we are stepping on and we need to sweep sometime. But well, it's not that. Soil is living and uh, has very, very important function. So now the idea is storing carbon in the soil. Why is it so important to store carbon in the soil? Because when you store carbon in the soil, you will capture through the plant and through a very low emission technology, solar energy powered, which is called photosynthesis. It's a revolution, but it exists for a long, long time ago. And using that photosynthesis, you will capture the the carbon in the atmosphere, bring it back in the soil when the plant will die with all the roots and all the exchange with the soil. So, first of all, combating climate change. Second one, when you increase the quantity of carbon in the soil through organic matter, you will increase the capacity of the soil to retain water for going through the very difficult period of drought or also to absorb the water when it rains a lot. So, it helps agriculture to be more resilient and to adapt to climate change. And finally, which is known by most of the people, increasing carbon in, uh, carbon in, the, in the soil will help fertility of the soil. You will get a better yield and you will also get a better stability of the yield. So you will increase food security and you will increase uh, the restoration of the soil. Finally, we are at the COP. That's the question you just mentioned. We are at the climate change COP. But if you look at the fact for a soil to be healthy, you will notice that if you have healthy soil, you will carbon rich soil with a low to combat climate change. Soil rich in organic matter is full of life and biodiversity, and it will help fighting losses of biodiversity. Soil rich in organic matter will absorb the high quantity of water and will avoid desertification, so you will combat desertification. And finally, fight as soil will help food security. So healthy soil are at the origin of all action that we need to develop under all the three main conventions of the United Nations plus the FAO. So this is really the starting point of all. And this is important to consider that. And I agree with Li Feng Li. We should have this in the mind of all the negotiator about the importance of soil and soil health for all those big conventions. So increasing quantity of carbon in the soil is feasible. We know that. 
we have so many practices. I will not come back on this. We, we know all those cat categories of practices. But what is important is just stress the point of what's going on there. When human beings start working on the forestry land and chop the trees and install agriculture, then you will start decreasing the quantity of carbon in the soil. And if you don't care, you will go in the red zone and in some part of the world, you will remove completely the soil and completely erode it. That's what also Li Fengli explained clearly. So what we propose is to change agricultural practice in order to come back in the pink area and then maybe the green area to retain, to recome to the, the potential of the soil and maybe in the future where we'll have technology to go over this and go in the, in the yellow zone. In fact, in this, we would like to encompass what we would like to do. The red curve show that civil society is asking us, working in agriculture, to decrease the quantity of mineral fertilizer, to decrease the quantity of agrochemical, while at the same time, on the, along the green line, we would like to increase the biodiversity and increase the soil organic content. So with the conventional agriculture, we are behind you, my friend, <laughs> at the bottom, <laughs> on, the, on the left part of this. This is conventional agriculture. And we need to get inspiration in a natural forestry ecosystem. That's what they call natural-based solution. Get inspiration in the nature. And moving from one to another, this is the blue arrow. That's the, it's not the golden arrow. It's the blue arrow of the agroecology. And in fact, Agroecology could be defined by many, many things, but we, we try to define it by a continuum of agricultural practices, starting with climate smart agriculture, if you want, conservation agriculture, organic agriculture, biodynamic agriculture, holistic grazing system, regenerative agriculture, permaculture, agroforestry. They all are agriculture that allow us to use nature-based solution to develop practices that will store carbon in the soil. So just a few words about the Four Per Million Initiative, which is a very funny name. It came from the fact that we compare the quantity of carbon in the soil with the quantity of carbon in the atmosphere. And uh, then, if you look at the activity, human activity, we release every year roughly 4.3 gigaton of carbon. That's what Li Fengli explained as a total from the very early uh, activity of the human being. And uh, if we increase by 0.4% the quantity of carbon in the soil every year, we may theoretically offset the 4.3 gigaton of carbon that we are releasing. So it means that it is possible, of course, it's every year on Earth, everywhere. Well, it's theoretical. But it gives the direction, and 0.4% is 4 per mil. The goal of the initiative, increasing f carbon in the soil to increase food security, adapt agriculture to climate change, and fight climate change against the context of the SDGs. All our members and partners are on this, not all, I mean, main countries, and uh, a lot of partners are there with the logo. And um, what is interesting is that we start with 160 partners, and now we are 740 partners, country, NGOs, organ international organization, uh, farmers' organization, business, and uh, scientific institution. Finally, uh, in uh, 2020, we adopt the strategic plan 2050, which is, will give us our vision of a worldwide healthy and carbon rich soil to combat climate change and end hunger. But it's also composed with 24 objectives that are included in six goals. And if we cover the world things by 2050, well, this question of soil and carbon soil and climate change and biodiversity loss and so on will be solved, hopefully. We hope to reach that before 2050, but uh, it's, it's like all strategic plan, very, very ambitious, and we hope that we will be able to do it. Finally, we all have encompassed what I explained to you in this small book that you can get online if you want. This small book is just devoted to the 4 Million Initiative and all the money collected is going to the, to the initiative to continue our work. So I thank you very much, and if you want more information, please, go on our website. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paul. Also, uh, allow me a small question. Um, the role of the uh, carbon market was highlighted by Li Fengli. 
Um, and I wanted to ask you also, do you see this as at the center stage of a potential breakthrough of the solution coming? Or what would you wish for the parties to come out with as an outcome from the negotiations? Uh, thank you for this question. It's, it's the carbon market is very important. Very important to help the farmers to go in that. But we insist on two points. The first one is that the farmers, when it works, produces product that could find a normal and good remuneration on the market at the, for them to be paid for their work, to be paid for the cost, and to be paid for the living of their family. All the money they can get on the top of that, through the carbon market, for instance, through incentives for some other countries, could go for environmental services. And that's really what we hope that could be additional money and that the people are not using the carbon market money to pay a lower price to the farmers and balance the price with, with the carbon market money. So we need to be very conscious. It's very important. We need this carbon market money, but don't mix up the price for, for the goods and the carbon market remuneration. Okay, thank you for that clear message. We can discuss also later further on that point. But now I invite uh, Soraya Sierda here to our, our stage. Uh, she is uh, coming from Egypt and working in a local coalition of partners. Uh, among them is the Egyptian Biodynamic Association. Uh, the Egyptian Biodynamic Association tries to implement the solutions that are lying uh, behind regenerative agriculture here in Egypt. And she's working together uh, with this organization um, to convert more than 2,000 farmers already uh, to organic agriculture and biodynamic agriculture and also uh, in the field of the carbon credit um, potential and the kind of generation of carbon credits, making them uh, available to farmers. And I'm very happy that you are here. We know each other from our work. So please help us to understand what is available now. Thank you, Max, and yes. thank you, Max, and thank you all for being here. Actually, the agricultural sector in Egypt is the main pillar of economic. Yes, <laughs> we can say is agriculture sector participated with 14.5 from Egypt GDP, and same time more than 28 percent from Egyptian people work in agriculture. And actually, agriculture sector is facing a lot of challenges. We have poverty, we have water scarcity, we have population growth, land degradation, and of course now the main and the current challenge with climate change: raising sea leaves, heat waves, and the crop failure. To facing all this challenge, we knew needing a new system, new thinking, critical thinking. And with cooperation with SICM and the Egyptian Biodynamic Association, we created this new system which is called economy of love. Economy of love meaning you understand my challenge and I understand your challenge so we can cooperate. We can summarize economy of love in just three words. Transparency, ethical, and sustainable economy. And we thinking how we can apply this how we can incentive the farmer to apply this. Because one of the main aims of economy of love is to convert agriculture sector from one of the main source of greenhouse gas emission to one of the source of sequester and saving carbon emission. This can be done by converting agriculture to be an organic farming. This is farm model have four main indicators. Soil carbon sequestration, Afforestation, composting, converting animal and green waste to be a composting, and using renewable energy as the main source of irrigation. So when the farmer applying this four indicator in his farm, we can say it is an organic carbon model of the farming. We start in 2018 with the phase one, with second farm in Al-Wahat al-Bahariya, and 
phase two is starting from 2021 till 2023 to include more than 2,100 farmers in this model. And we, we are going to upscaling this product to be still reaching phase four, which will be more than 25,000 of farmers in Egypt have the economy of love. This is EOL certificate. We certified our certificate in ISO 14064123 and ISO 14065 to have a certified agriculture carbon credit. This is the first certified credit in Middle East. Each one carbon credits, it's meaning you planting 13 trees, converting 100 meters square from desert to be an organic agriculture, producing 15 ton of composting. And we created a platform. Till now, it's included around 2,000 farmers in this platform, issue this EUL carbon certificate. And we have a cooperation with UNDB, especially for the COP27. We're speaking about solution. And we, with UNDB, created this platform. It's called Zero COP27. The idea of COP27, Zero COP, that we're doing carbon footprint assessment for each participant here in the COP. Business flight, stay in the hotel, local transportation, and we issue the credit per average participant. So each one here can offset his emission and immediately download his certificate a carbon neutral participant in the COP. You just need to scan or just write it this typing, zero COP27 in your mobile, write it the name of participant, your organization name or your personal name, how many participants wins you, and one minute you can offset your emission. As I mentioned, each one carbon credit, it's meaning you offsetting your emission with planting 13 trees, converting 1,000 meters square from organic agriculture and producing 15 ton of compost in Egypt. Here you can say the platform, I needed to play, but maybe it's not playing. But finally, this is a story I would like to say. Thank you very much. <laughs> Fantastic. <laughs> Thank you so much. It gives me a sense of practical uh, implementation, bringing it down. Right now, what we have heard on a global scene, on the scientific background, on a political arena, with concrete initiatives, bringing it down here to Egypt is really an inspiration and uh, gives me hope. I would like to ask for a simple farmer now um, with whom you work. What does it mean this kind of carbon credit story that you have unlocked for the Egyptian context? Yeah. Actually, not in Egypt, but all the world have an issue regarding it to organic and healthy food. If you ask people would like to purchase organic healthy food, all the people will say is yes, we need. But if they go to supermarket and define the difference in the prices between the organic and the conventional, more people will go to the cheaper prices. And to solving this illusion, we need a new system. We need a new thinking. If you ask the farmer to change, he will say, yes, it's good for us, it's good for healthy, it's good for society, but you need to incentive him. You need to encourage him. We need the prices of the organic food to be the same like conventional food. We can solve this equation by EOL agriculture carbon credit or by any carbon credits because the impact of this credit will be a pure additionality income for the farmers. He will increase his income with just what he really do to improve his soils. He will not need to ask him for funds to converting to organic. He will not need to increase his, his prices of the organic food to increase his income. He will having additionality income. So we say agricultural carbon credit will be a solution to improving the food system in all the world. Yeah, thank you very much. I mean, that is really a game changer. I don't know if that is clear here for everyone in the room, but to have organic agriculture with products that are at the same price of the conventional and using the market as a mechanism for a transformation that we have seen is needed is i would think uh, worth another round of applause thank you very much another region uh, in europe uh, stands in front of the same uh, challenges and the same need for transformation i have here philippe burka with me the co-founder of regenerative agriculture uh, re <laughs> sorry 
the, the, the co-founder of Climate Farmers, and he has a very simple and bold idea, and I like it how you keep it simple, to build the infrastructure to scale regenerative agriculture in Europe. Thank you for coming and explaining us a little bit more about your work. Pleasure. I hope you can hear me despite the slight amount of uh, protest outside. So yeah, um, as was just mentioned, we are very much focused on Europe. So I think we have a very good understanding of uh, what's going on in the European context. But everything that I'm saying is very applicable for that. Um, I think the beginning, we can be quite quickly, we all know probably the, the planetary boundaries. We all know here in this room that agriculture is with 24% of all greenhouse gas emissions, one of the main reasons for us crossing them. The very interesting thing that I discovered when I wanted to get into farming myself five years ago is that we have a solution for this issue with regenerative agriculture. Regenerative agriculture plays into most of the trends that we have going on from rising fertilizer prices over the biodiversity crisis to the planetary boundaries. The interesting thing is we do know that it builds biodiversity, we do know that it stores carbon in the soil, we do know that it works against erosion, but it's not happening. When I started diving into regenerative agriculture, I was looking for regenerative farmers in the European Union and we found almost none. I discovered 60 farmers and visited those 60 farmers in the year 2019. I worked with them on their farms and I talked with them about what they think needs to happen. Based on the conversations with these farmers, we essentially build our theory of what needs to happen. One thing that is very problematic, you can find on the bottom left, is the lack of model farms. So farmers like to learn from other farmers. And for that reason, we need to, uh, we need to get to 10% of all farmland in Europe to be under regenerative management so that other farmers can go there and can see how regenerative agriculture can work in practice. The other issue is we need to make the case that regenerative agriculture economically makes sense in order to unlock it for farmers and for businesses to move into it. How does this work in practice? Two issues, knowledge and finance. On the knowledge side, we essentially focus on the mindset of the farmers to get it from the focus on yield, which we have been doing in the last 40 years, to a focus on soil health and building up soil health through the farming practices. On the finance side, we need to measure regeneration that is taking place and we need to start paying as society for the ecosystem services which farmers are providing for all of us. In order to get there, we did several experiments with farmers in 16 different European Union countries and we developed several levers which we can use in order to scale these practices. The first one is farm enterprise analysis. So we work together with farms with technical data ranging from satellite technology to analyze what contexts would make sense in their specific context and how the transition can look like for individual farmers. We then invite the farmers to join groups. We tried to do this first on Slack, then we had to settle for WhatsApp because that's where farmers are in the end. So we have regional WhatsApp groups in several different European Union countries where farmers can interact with each other, can learn from each other and can see how does the transition towards regenerative agriculture work for other farmers which are similar to me and do peer-to-peer -peer learning between them. After that, we match them with verified consultants in regenerative agriculture. Due to the hype that we had happening in the last three years, a lot of people are suddenly claiming to know what regenerative agriculture is. Most of them don't. So what we did, we built a consulting agency which is verified by farmers. If you want to join our agency as a consultant, you need to have other farmers stating that they work with you and can verify that you were actually helping them in their transition. So if a farmer requests a consultation through us, he can contact other farmers and ask them how it was for them so that they know that they're worth their money. Once that happened, we essentially take them through something which we call the transition blueprint. So we analyze the context of the farm, the business context, the ecological context. Then we create an implementation plan with them. We match them into the peer group. And afterwards, we start measuring with data how the, how the regeneration is taking place and what is working and what is not working. From that, we go into the IMRV technologies. We're using satellite technology and we're working with the Dutch Agricultural University Wageningen in order to analyze what works in what context and to help the farmer in figuring out how the transition can work over the course of five to 10 years. Once the farmer decided they want to commit to this, they can join a 10-year program with us and they, they get paid for the ecosystem services which they're providing by measuring the increase in biodiversity, the increase in carbon, and the increase in soil water storage capacity. 
We also have several nutrient studies running together with the European Union and the EIT Foods Program in order to show that there's more nutrient density in regeneratively produced produce in order to get premium prices for regenerative farmers. And all that we're doing, we're basically always looking what are the levers of change, what is the most efficient way of getting there, and what are the partners that we can use in order to make system change at scale in Europe happen. So please let me know if you have any questions. Thank you so much. I want uh, to know if um, these experiences that you have in Europe are also um, applicable and relevant for other parts of the world, especially now, let's say, here in Africa. And yeah, how, how can that, what you experience there, used as a case for other continents as well? I think one thing that's very important to say is regenerative agriculture is always context specific. We all know the five principles, but I hear way too many one-size-fits-all solutions coming up, and they just don't work. But some principles are definitely always the same, like farmers like to learn from other farmers. You can't show a farmer a fancy PowerPoint presentation and expect them to change. So I think the idea of having peer-to-peer -peer learning groups and of also having verified consultants which know the context of the farmer to help them in the transition and then to pay them for ecosystem services, that's applicable. That's generally everywhere. What the specific context will be and what the practices will be, that will change from region to region, from buyer zone to buyer zone, and from soil context to soil context, I would say. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, this uh, is it for the, simple pres uh, for the single presentations. Now we are going uh, into the plenum and uh, we are inviting also our uh, visitors here for voicing questions or giving, um, yeah, addressing our uh, panelists here. Is there someone who has a question? Maybe I start also. Does someone of the panelists have a question to the other panelist? Do you have a question? Paul, do you have a question uh, to the experience of climate farmers? Are you already collaborating? Well, it's difficult because the other panelists are also belonging to the 4 per mil initiative, so they, they know us a little bit and we know them a little bit. But it's, uh, it, it's amazing to have the example uh, shown by Soraya and, and uh, you also about uh, what we can do with the farmers. That's the most important thing. And what strikes me is that when we had the Green Revolution, it came from the science. This revolution is starting by the farmers. And this is this make disturbing for most of the institution because we don't know where to start. And what you said, bringing a WhatsApp group just to communicate between farmers, just it's a brilliant idea. But well, when WhatsApp did, do not exist before, it was difficult to, to imagine that. And also what you are doing, Soraya, Economy of love, what is a beautiful name for just bringing love in the middle of the relation between humans? Because most of the time it's uh, economy of money. So uh, there's no specially, I mean, uh, a question to ask them, but uh, I really appreciate to have partners like them uh, in order to bring life and bring reality to all what we propose. Because if not, all of that will remain words and words. Thank you. Mr. Paul, uh, no, sorry, <laughs> Mr. Li Feng Li, um, what do you have in mind when you hear these local initiatives or regional initiatives, um, and how can that kind of uh, help the FAO to leverage their funds, to leverage their knowledge? I'm so glad. I'm really so glad because of what I talked is something that's knowledge product developed de develop with our members, with our scientists. I'm so glad that in reality, it's happening. It's demonstrated by the farmers on the ground. It's achievable, it's doable, and let's just do it. I think what I would really like to see, you know, how we can help you to really to further scale up and then to make such knowledge available, shared with other members, you know, through the WhatsApp group, through the internet, through the farmers, you know, uh, school, and then to make much, you know, uh, benefit, you know, and then ensure this activity and gradually scale up to the scale that can really to achieve the, the ambition that's either developed by uh, Lou and or by global water, global soil partnership to keep 
the carbon and the ground in the soil. Thank you. Thank you very much for all of your presentations. It's been really fascinating. My name is Michael Overton. I'm representing Scientists Warning Europe. Uh, my personal research is in land abandonment in Europe. Can I wanted to ask you, um, from each of your perspectives, or maybe one person would like to pick the question. Further, near, near is my mouth, okay. <laughs> um, a question about land sparing. What is the role of land sparing, by which I mean complete demanagement, pulling back from the land in the farming regimes, uh, perhaps focusing on Europe, but sorry, perhaps sorry. elsewhere? Can you uh, re-tell your, or uh, re-say your question and uh, a little bit more slowly and directly in the mic? We could not understand it clearly due to all the r noise. Uh, yeah? Okay, can you hear me now? Fantastic. Apologies for the uh, wasted time. <laughs> um, I'm Michael Overton, Scientist Warning Europe. Uh, is a question about land sparing. So in the European context, uh, complete demanagement of land um, and abandonment is occurring. And my question is, what is the role, if any, of, of land sparing within agricultural regimes, uh, policy regimes or otherwise? Thank you. To whom do you address the question? I'm not sure. Maybe a um, gentleman on the right, perhaps, was, uh, had this idea that um, natural regeneration of forests might be the aim. Yeah. Paul. Well, thank you for that question. Um, I would say that uh, agriculture at the moment is uh, occupying a lot of space in our landscape. And uh, we all know that with a better way of managing the land at the global level, but also at the regional and the national level, we could produce the same quantity of food in a better way and produce also some uh, biosourcing products for our industry also with less land and we I mean not us but the scientists show that if we selected land that were already used by men and doesn't show the potential the full potential of what we hope they could produce we could help restoring and choosing 15% of those land with avoid a lot of losses of biodiversity and, uh, and will store carbon in the soil. So we need that, that it's a global idea about that, about changing a little bit our diet, maybe eating a little bit less, less food, less, uh, sorry, less uh, meat, and also producing meat a different way. But we need to be aware of that was said before. Each situation of developing agriculture is very specific in the place you are doing it. So. When the people said, oh, we need to stop eating meat, well, it's, it's just really straight away. But you need to understand that some civilization and some part in Africa and some other place, they are only eating animal products. So we need to respect that and be aware of that. So how we can produce meat, milk, leather, whatever, the different way we are doing today? That's the question and storing carbon in the soil instead of emitting more carbon. That's really the challenge, and that's what we need to go for. First of all, I would like to say thank you for the presentations. I have um, heard about your project only very recently, and I'm still trying to understand the concrete work you're doing but I have heard about your project in the short time from three different sources, so that's a good sign. You're reaching now um, more people. Um, my question is that uh, how far are you working with other successful agriculture projects and maybe kind of exchange your um, speciality or your success story with others and maybe integrate and keep learning and uh, accelerating um, the, the work you are doing and I, I would even have a concrete question maybe after the session uh, for collaboration and I have to say that I disagree uh, with the idea that we have to find more modern ideas, technologies to, for example, go for meat production and keep the consumption as we do it. Right now, I do think we have to face the fact that we have to reduce and change our lifestyles as well. Thank you. So these are two questions. The first one was addressed to Soraya, and then we spice the 
discussion up to with Paul again. Yes. Uh, thank you for your question. Actually, when we started to thinking about this idea, we need to be more uh, planning to success. So we look to the Egypt, what is the current agriculture system now? We divided the agriculture sector to four sectors. The first is the organic agriculture. There was a small part, less than 280,000 farmers, who already is an organic farmer in Egypt. So awareness in this farmer is more higher than others, and easy to access them than the conventional farmers. So we put them to the main target for us, the organic agriculture farmers in Egypt. The second phase was the new land. As you know, Egypt can divide it to two sectors, the delta, the old land, 5,000 years ago, and all the new land is a desert area, the new project. It was a problem in the old land because 99% from them is a convention, put it pesticide and other issue for very long time. And to convert it, this land to be an organic, it will need a lot of time to be organic minimum three years to reduce or remove the effect of the pesticide in the soils. And the third phase was the new project. We put it all the new project, which is already in the desert, should be an organic farming. We started with the phase one. This is, was the organic farming. They already have composting. They produce their composting. They have a trees. They already have organic or uh, regenerative practice inside their farm, and we discussed with them the idea. Why always your organic prices is higher than convention? Why we always have a problem to selling this product? And do we need to export it outside Egypt to cover your cost? If we have another solution, you will do the same practice you're doing, but we will certify it, measuring, monitoring, and certify this amount of carbon inside your farm, and getting it to you and agriculture carbon credits. And you shouldn't pay any money in the first, but you, we will selling the credit, and after that we will deduct less than 10% to cover the cost. So all the people say is we are with you in this phase. And we already success to include it, most of the organic farmers in Egypt in this, pro uh, this uh, project. And we are going to second phase and third phase by incentives them success of the first phase will encourage farmers to include it in the third and fourth phases. Thank you. Thank you. And over to the second question. And uh, a small remark that for the future question and answers, we try to keep it short because time is limited and then we have more chance to hear more voices. Thank you. It was just a comment, not really a question. But uh, I agree with you. I never said that technology is going to save the things. I just said we need to, need to use agriculture in order to put carbon in the soil. That's, that's all the purpose of it. That's all. But I agree if people like to eat meat, well, they could be flexible. We cannot encourage them to eat meat every day, which is stupid. We all agree on that. But some civilization, they are eating animal products the whole, every day, and they have no choice. That's what they are doing. I'm not talking about burger. I'm talking about proper meat and proper blood sometimes and milk. So sorry for that. Thank you for, Thank you for clarifying. Another question. Good afternoon. My name is Petra Laux. I'm head of sustainability for Syngenta Crop Protection. I'm interested in the climate farmers' experience. So we are very interested in the experiences of region ag farmers and inputs. You said. Um, the outcome measure should no longer only be productivity, but more on soil health. What is your experience then in regenerative farming on productivity and on the use of inputs um, to secure the crop? How much do you still use? You know, how do you see this going forward? Thank you. Interesting one. Um, yeah, I don't. To be honest, I don't see chemical fertilizers playing a role in regenerative agriculture. I see organic fertilizers playing a role. In the end, I really believe in uh, outcome-based regenerative agriculture. Right. So any product sold that helps with restoring soil health is for me part of regenerative agriculture. So I would always bring it down to earthworm population. Very one very easy way of seeing if soil is regenerating is if your earthworm population is increasing. Right. So if you're taking a sample once a year at the same spot, 20 times 20 times 20 centimeters, and you have more earthworms in the following years, 
you're probably doing a good job in regenerating your soil. What you use, what products you put on it, I don't care. If you can put glyphosate on your soil and your earthworm population is increasing, amazing. I doubt it, but totally possible. And in terms of yield, we have already studies coming out from America, which it pains me being European, but they're a bit ahead, I think because the food system was more messed up. And there you see that over the course of 10 years, you have more yield on average from regenerative agriculture due to climate change resilience. So you have less crop loss. So with basically fertilizers, you have more yield in extreme years and more yield loss over the course of time. And over the course of time, higher soil health leads to higher climate change resilience, yields to higher yield output overall. Uh, hello. Uh, my name is Tayer Mohammed Hashim. I am from Nigeria. Uh, I am the founder of Panacea Foundation, an organization that plant trees and create awareness on tree planting. Uh, I want to thank the speakers for this wonderful presentation. And my question goes to all the speakers. Um, you see, every year we come with these uh, powerful ideas, innovations, and everything. But we come to realize that there is a huge gap between these ideas and the vulnerable communities, or the farmers in general. So my question is this. Uh, that the, years, the theme of this year's COP is implementation. So what different approach do you have to make sure that these ideas get to implementation, especially to the farmers? Thank you. Mr. Li Feng Li, do you want to comment on that? Yeah, I think quickly, it's, I, I'm, as I said, you know, we're so happy to see you know, lots of ideas, in fact, has been implemented on the ground. And for the soil organic garden or sustainable soil management, we have been reached out, you know, also through you know, our communication uh, effort, you know, develop all these kinds of uh, knowledge product and which is easier to be read, to be accepted by the farmers. So turn all the scientific reports, maps into specific guidelines, for example, sustainable soil many you know, guidelines, you know, it's really down to the earth, you know, which can be easily picked up by the farmers. FAO also have the farmer uh, school, and which is really at the village level, be able to pass on these kinds of practice and knowledge to the farmers. I think we see that there are good opportunities and a good mechanism so far to be able to support the implementation. Thank you very much. Now I invite the last question here from the, spe uh, from the uh, visitors. A friend, John Delio, known for ecosystem restoration. Over to you. Um, I'm wondering if it's possible to link the food security issue more closely with, with the uh, possible famine and the soil restoration initiative. Because World Food Program is saying that even if they get 100% of the pledged money, they will, f they will only have half as much as they need to deal with the potential famine now that the your Ukrainian war and Russian war is is causing disruptions. Couldn't we help the local farmers to grow more food with that with that funding rather than bring excessive food from other places? And could the food the soil and uh, uh, farmer f schools go to those communities? Certainly, yes. Certainly, that's at least in my view, certainly, yes, we can encourage the farmers to produce much, much more and to produce much better. And, uh, and indeed, as I mentioned, you know, one third of the soils on this planet is degraded. That's why even from the ecosystem restoration perspective, it's certainly FAO's number one interest would be how we can restore those degraded soils, deg degraded arable land, so as to help the farmers through the restoration, improve the productivity, stabilize the soil, capture the carbon in the soil, as well as to produce much more food locally. Certainly, yes, unfortunately, you know, because of the war between uh, Russia and Ukraine, disturbed the global food market. But we strongly believe in many other countries that there's still a potential to produce more. However, having said that, at the moment, we don't have that system. 
We don't have the system to, to tell, okay, if a number of the countries, their agricultural production got disturbed, where are the other countries can potentially produce more? That's why from the beginning of this year, we started a new initiative. The aim of this new initiative is for any single crop, we will set up, we will develop a soil, land, and a water information system for any given crop in the future. So hopefully in five to 10 years, any major crops at least, we have this system, we can say, okay, if the weight production in one country is disturbed, or there's a disaster, or there's, you know, uh, there's a disease, then how possible the other countries can produce more than supply to the global market. So certainly we will look at that uh, exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much. That brings me now to an end. Sometimes I wish that uh, the climate negotiations uh, can be done with people here on the panel and then decided together. Um, what I take from the session is that regenerative agriculture addresses multiple crises at the same time uh, at a really uh, important scale because soil, as we heard, is really one of the biggest sinks for carbon and um, the potential of addressing the global emission problem is can be only solved by a full systemic shift to uh, sustainable agriculture. And that is uh, something that maybe three, four years ago you wouldn't hear as clear among all the different participants and panels that I have seen actually. The Rexall initiative is something really important and um, we will follow up on that, I, I, I would say, and learn from it, from these available resources. And uh, I really like the picture of looking at the natural forestry ecosystems as the kind of final end of the journey to learn from Mother Nature because the Earth probably will survive if we as a human civilization uh, don't manage to uh, address our problems and uh, the earth will still be around but we can learn from the earth and work together with it and I'm really happy that the f farmers have been put in the center stage of this transformation and are the real heroes for climate change. Thank you very much and I wish you a nice conference. <laughs>